Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Lou. I'm gratefully recovered alcoholic. It's been 40 years, 4 zero. One day at a time, by the God, God's grace. Because I'd say without the help of my higher power, I would not have been able to do it. It's impossible, at least for me. Uh, <clears throat> on the morning of 7th of January, 1971, I came to. I'd say I came to because I was awakened. Uh, by one of my subordinates, a junior NCO who had cursed me out and said, you blew it this time. Your commander is waiting for you. And I came to and I woke up and I realized that I have no recollection of the last seven days of my drinking. You see, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous in 1969 and when the man walked on the moon, it was direct, direct telecast on the television. And we just came off from the East, uh, the North Korean, uh, Korean border, the DMZ. Everybody went to sleep, and I wanted to see it. I was excited. The man is stepping on the moon. And I was physically sober then, and I was elated. What a great achievement. I was, uh, I felt really good. Uh, and I think I was sober about, anybody remembers what day it was? About 15th, 12th or 16th of, of August or something like that. I wasn't going to that. But nevertheless, ne- ne- nevertheless, uh, I've already attended Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, but before that, <clears throat> I was um, monsoon season, season started sometime at the end of July and I remember as the sun was setting down I looked over to the mountain and it was a lot of quartz crystal on the side of the mountain it was mixed with quartz crystal <clears throat> And I saw Chinese communists. And I took over my automatic weapon. I swung over and I started firing at him. Now, you could not let a fire, one bullet, go out of that rifle without the command approval of eight army commander. And here I am firing into a mountain. Two loads of ammunition. <clears throat> And all shit broke, broke loose. But later on I found out I was actually hallucinating or having uh, lively DTs, delirium tremors. I was seeing things that wasn't there. I saw things that wasn't there. My platoon leader was rushing over with half of the platoon and he says, what was it? He says, 125 Chinese communists! Because that's what I saw. Now, I don't know where that 125 Chinese communists come from, or the number come from, but that's what I told him. And the morning, I, they took me into the nut ward in the hospital, and I stayed there for about three, four days, and I saw the snakes and the rats come out of the wall. And that's when one of the Korean soldiers who saw me started acting out. He called, punched the alert button, and about people came out all, the, all, all over the places, and Eight people helped me into what we call the I love me jacket. You know what that is? <laughs> it's a straight jacket. That's where they put psychiatric patients in. And it took eight people to put me in there. And then I came out of it, I think a day, day and a half later. And then about two days later, I reported back into my company. I was okay. The doctor put me on some medication to stop me from going back into DTs or convulsions. 
Now, to get to that point, <clears throat> you have to drink a lot of booze and physically have to be hurt and psychologically have to be hurt enough to get to that point. I believe that I was an alcoholic the first time I picked up a fir my first drink. I was an alcoholic before I picked up that first drink. I'm Hungarian by nationality. My parents were teachers, and my father was celebrating his name day back in October, back in 1939. And about 15, 10, 15, 20 teachers came over to our place. And... Uh, they were all dressed up nice, somber, <coughs> straight-faced, you know, nice dresses and three-piece suits. And my father went down through a basement and brought up a case of red wine. Out came the cork and uh, the crystal glasses, and everybody drank one or two glasses. And an hour and a half, two hours later, they were gone. None of them were drunk. Some of them were happier than others, but I saw a happy face and a sparkle in their eyes. And I was looking at them. I said, they are happy. He says, I bet that that red stuff they were drinking had something to do with it. I want to be happy too. I want to be happy too. And... Uh, as my parents escorted the teachers back halfway to the town, our housemate was playing with her boyfriend. I walked into the dining for the dining room, and I looked those glass, looked at those glasses. And what would a curious kid do? Run in there and drink some wine and run out before he gets caught. Not me. I walked in there. I walked to the doorway and I looked at those glasses. I said. This is all mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I got all the glasses together and I poured them together because I wanted to see how much it, how much it is. Uh, it was two glasses, six ounce, four to five wine. I got drunk naturally, but I remember how it felt. And this was the first time I was free. Because I was scared all my life. I was always alone. I didn't have anyone to play with. My sister was older, six years older, and she was in a convent in school. And I didn't have anyone to play with. So as a kid, I, all, I pulled all kinds of ruckus, all kinds of bad stuff to get the attention of my parents. Because as long as they were beating on me, at least they were with me. And I got a lot of beating all my life. Uh, my father died in 1944 during World War II, and then all hell broke loose. Up to that point, I think uh, my life was fairly even as a kid, as a normal kid should be, but I don't think so. Well, one of the things happened was every time I, uh, my mother was angry, I got, I got the short end of the stick. And I was wondering why she was doing that. I think she was doing it out of frustration. And I was the only one who could beat on. Well, one of the things I remember is that when I drank that wine, I felt good. And I was sold. It was instant for me. And I was three years old, not even three years old, about one week, one and a half weeks before my th third birthday. I thought I was four years old, you know. My, on my 61st birthday, uh, uh, belly button birthday, I'm talking with my sister. She said, no, 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 you were three years old. I said, I see, sister, see, sister, this is what I'm talking about. No communication in the family. We can't even talk with each other. I'm here, I am 61 years old, and now you, after 61 years, you're telling me that I was three years old when I drank my first drink instead of four. You know? I said, it's amazing. This is what we call no communication. Anyway, <clears throat> every time I had a chance to drink, I drank, and every time I had the chance, I did not drink just one drink, folks. I never in my life had one just one drink. 
I remember that. I had a flashback of my life just going just like that. Never once ever had I for just wondering. And I remember when I was a I got to the point where I, when I started drinking, I couldn't stop. I, I refused to drink. I would refuse to drink because I knew if the, if the host would put the bottle of wine away or the whiskey or whatever in just one glass, it would start a fire and I can't, you know, I have to have more. One was not, never enough for me. <clears throat> Naturally, when uh, all the inhib inhibition was gone, the true Lou came out, and I was a hellraiser, just like in just like during my young young years, you know. And in the military, I got into a lot of trouble with that as a result of it. <clears throat> in the army, I had five out of in in the first three years of my service when I began to have trouble. Altogether, I had eight Article 15s, three of them field grade, one court martial, and one uh, ch chain strap, 10 times in 36 months. <laughs> now, these things don't happen because, you see, if you have one Article 15, this is a commander's repr reprimand, if you want to call it nowadays. Uh, the commander calls in a chain of command, the people who work, on, work for, for him, and then he says, what should we do with this guy? He's got a drinking problem. Should we throw him out of the army now, or should we give him a chance to go to treatment for something? But they don't mess around anymore. In the old times, you could mess up, stay goody two shoes, and two months later they promote you back up again. And this is what happened. In three months, in three years, I changed trap ten times. That was a good worker. I shot. United States Army top 10 gunnery in 1961 in Grafenor. I have the trophy still to prove it that I was one of the best. But every time something had come or a promotion come, you know, uh, I get drunk and I create trouble. And before I know it, I'm in front of the battalion commander again. <coughs> but this time, the top commander of a whole battalion, about 500 people. And he shows me the promotion to Staff Sergeant E6. He tore up the order and reduced me from E5 to E4. Suspended the reduction, and less than two months later, I blew it again. You know, this was just because every time, you know, Dick was a Dick with a stick was my sponsor. And uh, sometimes I found myself making an attempt to justify my drinking. Well, I wasn't in trouble every time I was drinking. He says, Lou, damn it, go and take an inventory of yourself. How many times were you in trouble? Write it down. How many times did you get an Article 15? How many times did you get a court martial? <clears throat> I write it down. Each one of them had anything to do with alcohol. Every one of them. So it was a toss-up for me. Just like Dick said, he said, if I, if I have a drink, it's a toss-up. What's going to happen? Because one of the things also happened with me is that quite, quite often I was running into blackout. So in the initial stages of my recovery, I used to say, my name is Lou, I'm an alcoholic. When I drink it, I break out in spots. What spots? What's, I don't know, sometimes in Berlin, sometimes in Frankfurt, sometimes in Munich. Yeah. What do you mean? When I went into blackout, I get on a train and travel, and I don't know where I wake up at. These are the things that I used to do. <clears throat> By the time I got to the point when I was in Korea, I was drinking a fifth or a quarter of whiskey a day. I had to drink. And I was drinking 24 hours a day. And I didn't understand why I couldn't stop. I didn't understand why I couldn't stop. So finally I stopped, and I'm looking at the man stepping on the moon. I was elated. I was no longer drinking, and I was happy. And I was attending Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. What happened was, with my first sergeant, right away he recognized the symptoms in Korea. And later on I found out he called his sister. <coughs> 
His sister's husband happened to be an alcoholic who was already in sober for six or seven years in 1969. That's a long, long time. Six years of sobriety. Wow. He said, what can I do with this guy? He said, send him to AA. So while I was in the not ward in the hospital, he found an AA meeting for me, and I came back from the hospital. He said, Sergeant Oldie, front and center. I walk up, report to him. He says, here it is, an appointment. A division chaplain wants to see you. I said, oh, no. He said, all those goddamn chaplains, the only thing they want to do is counsel you, give you a bad boy, you know, give you all that stuff, and then you make you, they're going to make you feel guilty. And so you don't drink for two days, and then the third day you go back out again. <laughs> this is what the commanders did, and this is what everybody, the higher commander and the chaplain, you know, in, the old, in those old times, they used to say, go see the chaplain, have him punch you a tough shit card, you know. Because that's very tough shit. But two days later, you back up and drunk again. I did not know how not to drink. So I go into that meeting. I go to report to the chaplain. And the chaplain says, come on, boy. And he took me in the room like this. But there was no table in the middle. About 13 people sitting in a circle. And the first three people told me my story. Wait a minute. That first sergeant, he's got a conspiracy going on. He told them what to say. Right? And then all of a sudden, the other people start sharing some, something about their drinking. And their drinking was completely different. Well, when they were talking about how they betrayed their own promises to themselves, Just think about it. How many times did you get drunk? Really, really bad. Oh, God, this was a bad one. I ain't going to drink for two months. And then two days later, you drink it again. And you're wondering how, you, how come you can't keep your own promise to yourself. And I, I, I was just, you know, but it's my fault. I was besides myself because I didn't understand the connection, the disease portion. But yet at the same time, when these people were talking about how they felt in here, I understood for the first time in my life. For the first time in my life, I understood that this is an illness. For the first time in my life, I understood that the only way I can stay sober is to make a commitment not to drink just today. God, I was desperate to stay sober. Because I didn't want to drink anymore. I was hurting inside. My soul was hurting. So I kept coming back to those meetings and I got sober. Came back to Germany and five days, about a week or two weeks later, I started drinking again. I couldn't find a meeting. But at the same time, the alcohol solved the problem for me. The problem was that I couldn't stop again when I was back up again. So I went to the hospital, I got myself detoxed before I reported to my new, new unit. <clears throat> and the interesting thing is I did not tell my first sergeant that I was an alcoholic. <laughs> he said, what's the matter with you? You crazy or what? I said, you're a neuropsychiatric appointment in Nuremberg Army Hospital. I said, yeah, well, some of those people have a problem with alcohol, and I, I want to be there because I do have problem with alcohol. I do have problem with drinking. I said, okay. Now, if I would have told him that I was an alcoholic, they would have thrown me out of the Army for being an alcoholic. <clears throat> but it was okay to be a drunk. And we had many NCOs who were drinking in the club getting drunk. And the next morning, you know, shivering and shaking, but they were somehow performing. I still don't know how. Because I was in the same boat, and I didn't know how to perform. But my problem was, now once I stopped, I didn't know how, <clears throat> I didn't know how to stay stopped. 
And I didn't know how to stop. I, I didn't have the strength to stop, so I had to go into a hospital. With four months in Alcoholics Anonymous in Nuremberg, I <clears throat> tried to do my inventory. I didn't like it. So I decided I'm to kill myself. So I uh, b bought me a bottle of Jim Beam and a bottle of uh, vodka, Smirno. I finished the Jim Beam and half of a vodka, and I was sober. It didn't do nothing for me. I was a little bit drunk. You know, they could smell the alcohol on me, but it didn't do nothing for me. I was still hurting in the inside. And I got on the expressway on Autobahn number 73, going into the city of Nuremberg. And I was aiming for the center pole on the Autobahn. And I took the seat belt off. I closed my eyes and I was going for that one, doing 100 miles an hour. And something or oh, someone turned the steering wheel. <clears throat> Turn the steering wheel. And I look up. The pole is long gone and it says US Army Hospital turn back. And I drove right in. Turned myself in. <clears throat> I stayed sober for eight more months. Uh, I was in alcoholics. I go attending alcoholics. I was meeting one Friday afternoon, one o'clock to three o'clock in the afternoon. Sponsored and chaperoned by a lieutenant colonel, army chaplain. It was conducted in a neuropsychiatric clinic in Nuremberg Army Hospital in the conference room. As soon as the chaplain left, they closed the meetings. So we had to start looking around and go outside. And we had uh, one meeting in Gerhard Hauptmannstrasse in one of the housings, another one right across from William O'Darby Concern. There was two, house, two or three houses, and one of the girls, her name was Kay, and in her, up, uh, in her living room we had an AA meeting. And then we started our colleagues on animals outside family housing. Until in 1971, President, then President Nixon said, we have a problem in the armed forces. And all of a sudden, all colleagues on animals became popular. And that's when they left, permitted all colleagues on animals to come on the post in Nuremberg, in Nuremberg, Pinder, and all these outlying bases. And so I was able to attend four to five meetings. But by that time, I got to the point where I was quasi-alcoholic. Oh, yeah, I was an alcoholic, and it's okay. And I'm attending AA meetings, but at least one time, once a year, I can have a glass of champagne with my wife. So I went over to one of my sister-in-law's house on New Year's Eve, 1970. <laughs> And I brought the midnight down to 10 o'clock. And I had a glass of champagne. And I remember about 30 minutes after that. And by midnight, I was in a blackout. Hmm. And I came out of it on the morning of the 7th of January. And it would not have been much problem because they did not give me blood alcohol level to, uh, test or sobriety test. Later on, I found out I was <clears throat> outside of the post, 2 o'clock in the morning, had a car accident. I, well, I called the German police, explained them what happened. They thanked me for my courtesy. And I was three and a half, three point five 3.5 to 4 point oh blood alcohol level. My commander did not order me a blood alcohol test, but I was standing in front of him. He says, I'm going to have you called marshal by general court. Now, the general court marshal is the highest military, military, military tribunal, if you want to call it. And uh, I knew I was, I was in trouble. The problem was, that in the seven days while I was drinking, I, I, was, I got so bad 
that when I came up, I forgot how to read, how to write, and I couldn't walk a straight line. I lost my equilibrium. <laughs> I was staggering when I was sober. <clears throat> I walked into the dispensary the next day, the same day, and I had a friend of mine to take a blood alcohol level on a fictitious name, and they came up. We counted back approximately what was my blood alcohol level at the time when I had the car accident. And it was between 3.5, 4.0. Then I really, yeah, when I came to, before I walked to my commander, because you need to know this, I said, oh, God, what happened? And I was holding my head in my hand, and I heard a voice inside, Lewis, if you drink one more drink, you will die. If you drink one more, you will die. And from that moment on, I was desperate to get sober. On the 6th of January, 1971, was the last time I drank. The 7th is my first day. At least. Rationally, I believe that I did not drink anything on that, on that, on that morning, during that morning. And I haven't had a drink since. But the struggle I had to go through to get to this point, to here, there were six of us in Nuremberg group there was about 25 guys who used to come off and on, but six of us, we were coming steady. And then somehow we started matriculating together and we're having our own meetings separately in those family housings. And they just kept pounding it. Louis says, you make a commitment for today only. This is the only moment in your life you, you have in control. You have no tomorrow. You yesterday is gone. Just don't take a drink. And I kept coming back. Two and a half years later, I went to an Alcoholics Anonymous convention in Wiesbaden, in the Wiesbaden Air Base. And I had an A, a friend of mine, his name was Forrest, and he was in Fra station in Frankfurt. And he, get, he got there and I met Forrest, there was about 70 or 80 of us, and I was really happy to meet him. And Forrest, how are you? Thank you, I'm doing good. Where are you going? I'm going into this classroom. Why are you going into the classroom? We're going to have a workshop. What's a workshop? I you know these were strange words for me. What's a workshop? A workshop is we pick up a topic and we discuss it so everybody has a little better understanding about it. He says, what's the topic? He says, step two. I said, oh shit, they're going to talk about God again. And I didn't want to hear God. You know, I, I talked to God. I begged God to get me out of this trouble, and I get out of the trouble next time myself, but never did it. I always gave God a stipulation. Instead of just asking him to help me. And... Uh, <coughs> One time I walked into an AA meeting, I was about sober 10, 11 months, and these guys were talking. And they got all over the place. I said, oh, man. And I said to myself, if somebody's going to say God one more time, I'm walking out, and I ain't coming back. And just like somebody, you know, did a, you know, the, the music conductors, the orchestra conductors stick, you know, whoosh, and everybody was talking about HP. And I didn't know what that was. <laughs> HP. What the hell is that? <laughs> it's higher power. What's that? He said, well, your higher power was booze before. You better pick another one. And then in that second step, I finally began to understand what this is all about. Because when the role came out to me, talked to me, uh, all of a sudden, I saw a picture. And in that picture, I saw my mother. I was sitting in her lap in a chair when I church when I was about five or six years old. And she says, God loves. God's punish. 
That God doesn't punish. You punish yourself. God doesn't punish. And God's love is unconditional. Now, where in the hell did this come from? You know? And I remember when I, they taught me all good things. They didn't teach me bad things. And the revelation came to me, if God seemed so far away, guess who moved? My sponsor said, Lou, I want you to look at all your life of how many close calls did you have? And you know what close call is? You know what close call is? Uh, how do you call it? You see, this is when you almost had an accident or almost could have died, you know? <clears throat> and I had many, many, many close calls. And I asked myself, why am I living? Why am I still living? You know, I said, I never drove drunk in my life before. While I was in Germany in 1960, in the 60s, I didn't drive drunk. I didn't have a car. But then all of a sudden, a picture came in here. In 1958, I used to have a Ford Anglia. Fort Angela, a small mini car, 36 horsepower. And I was going to San Francisco on New Year's Eve, 1958. And I passed out at the wheel on the, on the Bayshore Highway 101. And I hit the center pole. My left front rear tire blew out, and I flipped over, and I stopped one foot from falling into lies close to 3rd Street turnoff into the Bay of San Francisco, which was 150 meters down. And I stopped, my car stopped flipping over one foot from falling into the bay. Wow, that's a close call. <laughs> okay? And I started to remember other things. The things that I <clears throat> did and I the things that I did and got away with it. Got away with it. You know, uh, signed my divorce papers with the lawyer. He goes home. I get on the train and I go prepared. Abel back, three fifths of whiskey. I got drunk on the train, passed out, and I wound up. A fence going by here, and the last stop of looking into it, the other side of the fence is Dady Adder. And I'm on the East German border. And I don't know whether you guys remember, but uh, <laughs> all of you <coughs> who were in the military at that time, when uh, the Dady Adder was existing, an American soldier was prohibited to be in the five kilometer zone. Unless you were on official border patrol. And I was in a unit where they were on border patrol, but I was prohibited from going there. And I'm on the train. What am I doing here? My AWOL bag is stolen. Naturally, good whiskey in there, you know. And I didn't drink it all, I know. I remember drinking half of it. And thank God they didn't rip me off because it it took me almost 15 minutes to talk a taxi driver in to drive me in uh, back to Erlangen, Germany from the border, East German border, which was approximately, <coughs> I don't know how many kilometers, Kronach, further up from Kronach. Uh, it's about 80, 80, 90 kilometers. It cost me 280 Deutschmarks. Uh, to uh, get back to home base. But it was after midnight, and midnight was bed check. And I didn't have a pass out to be outside after midnight. So the next morning, I was standing in front of the commander again. Another field grade Article 15. And it just went on and, and on and on. But you know, I had to do all those things what I did, I had to do all of them. 
to get to where I am today. But one of the things I haven't done when I came into, when finally I made a decision to not to take that first drink, and there were times in my life when I was shaking like an autumn leaf, and I didn't want to drink. But people said, call somebody in AA. Call somebody in AA. I had about 25, 26 AA telephone numbers. One time I was sergeant of the guard. And about 20, 28 or 29 men under me. <clears throat> and we were having a guard mount. And the enlisted club is right here. And all of a sudden I started to have the shakes. This was nine months after my I came back into AA in September 1970. Uh, September, October 1971. I said, oh, my God, it's here again. And so uh, uh, the commanders of the relief, I let them go. I let them go and uh, told them to take care of the guards. I got to make some phone calls. I, when are you going to be back? In about 10, 15 minutes, I'm going over to the telephone. <clears throat> So I started to call, started to call, and nobody was home. I knew Thursday there were two places where AA meetings, everybody was there. I called the wife, she said, he's in a meeting, he's in a meeting, he's in a meeting. Oh my God, what am I going to do? I got in a desperation, one, two more numbers, one in California, one in New Jersey. I said, well, New Jersey is closer, so I called that one first. It was an Alcoholics Anonymous hotline. And the guy said, well, this is an A hotline, you can't be talking too much. I said, you son of a bitch. He says, I'm in Germany. I'm calling you from Germany. He said, what? I said, yeah. He says, I have a desire to drink. I can't go to a meeting. I can't talk to all my friends, AA friends, because they're in a meeting. And I have an urge to drink. And I'm 50 yards, less than 50 yards from the club. And I have a loaded sidearm over here. I said, I have a choice, drink, kill myself, or talk to me long enough until the desire to drink leaves me. Talk to me long enough until the desire to drink leaves me. This was in 1971. At that time, the Germans had some telephone cells with five my coins in there. And I made, I put in about four, five, six, five more coins in there. And we talked, we talked. And just soon I eased off, you know. He was just talking. I said, oh, my God. I said, man, just just let's talk, okay? A hey, hey, talk. And he was telling me a little bit of his story. And I was telling my story. And the desire to drink left me. And then I didn't have to drink anymore. This is when I learned the importance of picking up the telephone to call someone when you are hurting. You know, <clears throat> I still do that. Chris, is, uh, Chris can attest to that. <laughs> sometimes, not because I'm desperate, sometimes because I'm lonely. You know, this uh, the sobriety brought me through many, many things. I came to, back to Germany from the military when I was stationed in, in Fort Riley, Kansas, I came back to uh, Frankfurt, and it was in 1977. Since 1977 until I moved to 2005, this was my home group. I'm a lot of beautiful people. Brian Meinbiel. I used to go to uh, Ramstein, Ramstein Charlie. <laughs> I met Uli, then I met Sylvia. I met Henry, Ken, Pete, and the rest of you. This is a lot of power. Together we can. Alone I can't. Together we can. One of the other things I do today is that I get in connect, connection with my higher power. I call him God today. <clears throat> I do meditate every morning. It's the first thing I do when I go up. I, sometimes I don't even go to the toilet. I feel it's important enough to say good morning, God. And I get in touch with my higher power. And I ask him to give me the strength. Just give me the strength. 
<coughs> reprieve will come after that. Reprieve will come after that. And my day goes much better when I get in touch with my higher power because number one, I become, I become, become affected by the fact that I am powerless. I'm powerless over my addiction. I'm powerless over people, powerless over places, and I'm powerless over things. You know, <clears throat> one interesting thing that happened uh, during my recovery was, I mean, there were many, many interesting things, but one of the anecdotes I'd like to share, I think Chris was there too. <clears throat> I was uh, I was asked to be a guest speaker at a treatment facility, uh, you know, completion ceremonies when I had about 30 years of sobriety, a little bit over 30 years. <clears throat> And I was talking about it, and I don't know how many is it, uh, but 30 years, it's, it's, it's quite a lot of number of uh, 24 hours. <clears throat> and I said uh, the magic word, I says, I've been sober for 9,400 9, hours. And everybody was looking blind, like, well, hum, what, what's that? I said, it's about 30 years plus some months. Oh, my God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And Father Mark was there. He's uh, he's my so-called uh, <coughs> spiritual mentor, if you want to call it. He's a Catholic priest and a wonderful person. You know, a lot of people are uh, beating on Catholics and all that stuff with all the sh shit that re recently been happening around him. But I think that if if I could call someone the epitome of a true Christian Catholic priest, that's the man. Is you know he was the only priest I think in Vietnam who went into the zone without a weapon, without a sidearm. He never carried a sidearm, and the rest of the priests were carrying a forty-five at least. He didn't. He refused. Uh, and I said, uh, I am a recovering alcoholic, but Father, I would like to tell you that today. I'm also a recovering Catholic. <laughs> because number one, I I I knew I knew that the religion was it's in itself it's beautiful. It's the people what makes it ugly. Ugly people make, <laughs> ugly people make it ugly. And so what happened was <clears throat> And I'm quite sure many people can attest to this one when I was having a lot of tr trouble and tri tribulation when my wife was passing. <clears throat> I was visiting her in the hospital and I knew where she was going to go out. And I kept coming back to the meetings. I made phone calls and I cursed God and I begged God to forgive me. But one of the things I haven't forgot is I did not take a drink. I buried my wife, and I went through all these things. But you know, once I got the program and I became a sober person, <coughs> you know, in that in that AA meeting in Wingsbottom back in 1973, I had two and a half years of sobriety, and from the time I started to two and a half years, I was desperate because I, I had every once in a while, at least once a day, I had the shakes and I wanted to have a drink. The desire to drink was coming back. But after I discovered that God had been in my life all this time, the desire to drink left me. And I have not had a desire, and honest to God, I can say, <coughs> I have not had a desire to drink since the summer of 1973. And that's a long, long year. That's 39 years, actually. 29, 39, 30, 38, 39 years. I haven't had a drink, and I have not had the desire to drink. But it shows me that the program works. But I have to take the steps. I worked with Dick. You know, I fired him 10,000 times, <laughs> you know. And, 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 and the next day I called him. I said, what do you do this? What do you do that, you know? But I did the inventory, I shared with him all my shortcomings, and I worked on the program of recovery. Because I knew that there were promises. And the promises are still there. They haven't moved. 
Some of us moved, some of us moved back out there. And I saw them, at least seven or eight people die from Frankfurt International AA Group. And only two of them died sober, the rest of them went back out. So this program must offer something for me. Offers me, offers me the opportunity to look at myself, offers me the opportunity to, to look at where I'm coming from, what I'm feeling, and share with other people. One of the most important things for me in our Codex Anonymous today is Traditional Five. Carry the message. Carry the message to the suffering alcoholic. I'm still working with people. One of them is in Grafenberg. One of them is in Hornfels. You know, it's no distance. That's the only thing you have to do. pick up the phone. And we work the program of recovery. Because I know alcohol is still out there. It's kicking people's asses. It's kicking people, and people are dying. And I'm grateful for every moment of my life today. I wouldn't change anything in my life because I had to do all those things. They were hard knocks. Had to do all those things to get to me where I am today. I couldn't have done it better. You know? And I, st and, I, and I still have people to work with, you know, and I still have, I still have sponsors. I still have sponsors. You know, I'm in trouble or I get myself into trouble because I can't sleep. The first thing I'd call, I'd call Chris. <coughs> and he's, he's got 20 years less than I do. It's not what, how long, longevity you've been in our court economy, so, but what the quality of the sobriety is. And it's somehow when I get myself in a jam and I talk with him, he always gives me some good suggestions. It always comes with a program of recovery because, you see, if I don't work my recovery program, sooner or later my, the progression stops and regression comes back in. And regression is pour me, pour me, pour me a drink. That's how simple that is. You know, you can you can you can manipulate it any which way you want to, but the end result is pour me, pour me, pour me a drink. And once I take that drink, I'm gone. I know I'm dead. I have no choice. My liver was swollen to the maximum. I was close to cirrhosis of the liver. And the doctor, when I when I did my retirement physical, he said, "You son of a bitch! You didn't tell me you're an alcoholic." I said, I thought you could figure it out, Doc. He says, your relatives forgive you, your wife forgive you, but your body will never forgive you. He says, your liver is 60 millimeter lower. He says, it was so swollen and so heavy, it sank. 60 millimeters. That's six centimeters. That's more than two inches. You know, and I was wondering what the hell was having pushing me all, all the time. You know, and I kept on drinking because I didn't feel the pain. You know, that was the best escape in the room. But that same whiskey that I was trying to run away with from the pain was killing me, and I didn't know it until I walked in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. I walked in to see the psychiatrist after I went from the nut house, and he smelt alcohol on my breath, and I already finished the sex pack in the morning before I walked, walked in. He said, how much did you drink? I had only one. <laughs> he said, well, don't drink but two. I said, you son of a bitch, don't you even know when I'm already halfway drunk? They didn't understand alcoholism at that time, back in the 60s and 70s. They didn't understand it. And I said, I can't go to anybody to talk about my problem. I don't have anybody. And then a miracle came in. But that's another story. I think I talked long enough. And I still like to have a feedback if I don't mind. I would like to thank everybody and I sincerely appreciate you being here. And thank you for the sobriety. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.